Welcome back, everybody, on this wonderful day, evening, morning, or night, whenever you're watching us. We are starting a new chapter in environmental science today, and a pretty interesting topic, climate alteration and global change. It's kind of been building up to this with the air pollution chapter, but now specifically we're trying to dive and understand how do the substituents in our atmosphere affect the globe in a more global look, not just temperature, but what are the altering effects of that? And this sad photo we have here is a polar bear that does not have enough ice. Um, polar bears need these ice fields to go and dive and crunch through the ice and get seals. And they typically eat the fatty pieces of the blubber and then they leave the carcasses and then little foxes go out and eat the carcasses. And there's this whole ecosystem around these polar bears. And climate change is starting to push this ice back into liquid form and we're losing that habitat. So let's talk about some of the key ideas. Here are the six laid out for us. And today's lecture, we are going to focus on the first two, distinguishing among what global change is versus global climate change versus global warming. They all stem from global change. And then we're gonna dig into all the different substituents of greenhouse gases, where they come from and what the effects are. So let's first focus on number one. It'll be the shorter discussion versus number two. So global change, this is really the top. This is really above at the top. This is any chemical, biological, or physical change in the properties of the planet. So this is very broad. And these could be natural periods of, of change. So this is not necessarily man-made. Global climate, this really has to do with the weather of the Earth. So is the weather changing? And then global warming is, is that weather pattern affecting the temperature? So it's one specific apt aspect of the global climate change. Um, I like this better here. So this is from our book. So global change, this could be increased contamination. This could be emerging infectious diseases, for example. This could be rising sea levels. These are very broad. One of the global changes is global climate change. Within that, this can mean talking about storm intensity. That's not necessarily focusing on specifically temperature. This could be ocean patterns, circulation patterns differing, altering the precipitation and temperatures. And then finally, global warming is part of that climate change. And that is the warming of the, the planet's everything, the global temperature, the land, air, and the water. So what this does is gives us more drastic seasons, reduced in the sense that we have these reduced cold spells and increased heat waves with these more drastically warm seasons. So that's the idea of global um, change, climate change, and global warming. So very subtle, but they are, they are different discussions. So that's really key idea number one, getting those definitions out of the way. So we're really going to be focusing now on global warming here. So key idea number two is exploring the concept of the greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. So what are these gases that make our planet warm? And this is a good thing. We need these greenhouse gases, but just not too many of them, too much of them. The greenhouse effect comes from the fact that everything on, on Earth, we get our energy essentially from the sun but a lot of that energy just bounces away. About a third of it is reflected back into space. So this is a figure from our book showing this. I, I was pretty okay with this figure. There's a lot on the internet, but I kind of like this, this top-down view like this. So step one, we have a whole lot of solar radiation coming, coming through. About a third of it is reflected by clouds, atmosphere. Um, it's, some of it's actually reflected by the surface of the earth as well, but the rest of it is absorbed. So it gets absorbed, the water, the trees, us, everything. It's absorbed and then some of it is emitted. So it's emitted at a lower energy level. It's emitted at that warm, kind of we can feel that warmth, that infrared radiation. And a lot of that just goes back into the atmosphere, or sorry, goes back into space. But some comes up into the atmosphere and is absorbed by the greenhouse gases. This is what keeps our infrared energy back towards the surface. This is what's really warming the surface. Because if we just lost all of it, we would, we would die. The temperature of the Earth would be too cold. So we need greenhouse gases to absorb this. So they warm themselves, and then they emit a little bit more of their energy goes back towards the Earth. And then we absorb that back on the Earth. So that's kind of the greenhouse effect cycle. So we have all this stuff up in the atmosphere that's absorbing this infrared energy and coming back down. Uh, this is just 
kind of saying a couple more of those specifics that I just talked about. One thing I'm going to note is that the ozone layer is part of that. We talked about the ozone layer that's absorbing high energy UV, UV radiation that is bad for us. So some of that is what we're talking about here. The ozone layer is part of is part of the greenhouse gases, but it doesn't absorb all of it, and a lot of it comes back through. But the ozone layer is part of that, that uh, part of the greenhouse gases, green, the greenhouse layer. And again, this is what I just said in words. So you guys can pause and read these if you like, or check the PowerPoint when I upload it. So what are the greenhouse gases then besides ozone? One of a big component is water vapor. So just water coming from the oceans and all of our part of that hydrological cycle that we talked about. So there's always going to be a certain amount of water vapor. And that really depends on where you are on the earth, the temperature, the weather patterns, things like that. Carbon dioxide is the other big one. Methane is the other big one. And nitrous oxide. Notice I put the, and this is H2O, I put the chemical formulas here to remind you what these are. CO2 for carbon dioxide, CH4 for methane, N2O for nitrous oxide, not NO2, N2O, and ozone, O3. So digging into that a little bit deeper, how much of this stuff is up in the atmosphere? So water vapor, I mentioned, it, this really depends on the temperature and the weather patterns, things like that. And it doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long. It's a, it's a pretty fast cycle, a hydrological cycle. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, notice the concentration. So relative to each other, this is a big number versus some of these. There's a lot of CO2. It's the major component of the greenhouse gases. And its duration in the atmosphere is very, it's highly variable. So really just depends on the cycles that are happening right now. And this number, think of this as the base level, global warming potential, as in the higher this number is, the higher potential for global warming that this compound has. So as you go down to the next ones, methane is 25 times more intense in terms of global warming. And it's about 1.8 parts per million versus 390. Then nitrous oxide is even worse, about 300. There is less of it. And then these man-made chlorofluorocarbons. There's a significant portion of them up there. Remember, we talked about air pollution. These are the ones that are actually destroying ozone which is bad and they're also just really bad for global warming too as it turns out really bad actually so the more of this that gets up there these are really bad for the increase in global temperature and these stay around for a long time up in these atmospheres so there's your relative kind of composition of what we see in our in the composition of the greenhouse gases so where are the sources then yeah you know, we talked about the fact that they're they're there now where do they come from there are natural and human causing, anthropogenic. So some of the natural sources we see mainly carbon dioxide coming from volcanic eruptions. Relatively speaking, that's a very small amount from the anthropogenic sources. Methane we see from decomposition of plants and animals in low oxygen areas. So wetlands, underwater, deep sea composition. Anytime you have decomposition of plants and animals in low oxygen situation, you're producing methane. This is also what we see in landfills for the anthropogenic source. We get that methane production. Nitrous oxide comes from the denitrification cycle. So this also comes in low oxygen situations, deep in the soil, in those wetland regions. So this is part of that denitrification process where nitrates can convert, get converted to nitrous oxide and go, get up into the atmosphere. And then again, water vapor is, that's all around us and it varies from climate to region. This is a photo of a large, large explosion. I don't remember where this came from. This is in the book, but you can, the, when these happen, a lot of CO2 is emitted, but they're relatively rare. This is an interesting source of methane. This is from our book. These are, there's specific bacteria that live in the gut of type, different types of herb, herbivores. Some of those being termites. So termites will eat things, cellulose, wood, you know, th um, bark, things that contain cellulose. And one of the byproducts of the gut bacteria inside them is methane. So you can actually produce a lot of methane when you have millions and millions of small, tiny termites like this. So that's another natural source of methane, decomposition, but in the guts of animals. So human sources, and there's another slide that has all these on the next the photos, sorry, in the, the diagram. But I went back and I, I kind of listed these next to these. 
to show the different compositions that come out of this. So burning fossil fuels, mainly it's CO2. When you think of burning fuels in your vehicles, things like that, it's carbon dioxide, but they do produce a little bit of carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide. But this is really, you think cars, you think CO2. Agricultural practices. So this is where we have, instead of termites, we have cows ingesting food and they have got bacteria that also, one of the byproducts of the digestion process is methane. So cow's digestive process produces a ton of methane. So that's anthropogenic because this is not a natural occurring amount of cows. We're breeding these cows. And then we also have N2O that we produce through our agricultural process because we're putting a lot of nutrients back into the soil. And then we have the natural nitrate breakdown back to N2O. Deforestation is also produ you produce carbon dioxide in the, compo or the um, combustion process but compared to CO2, it's just a tiny amount. And then landfills, we talked a lot about landfills and the fact that decomposition beneath the surface in zero oxygen atmosphere, we produce a lot of methane. The last one for something like an industrial production are CFCs, the refrigerants, the chlorofluorocarbons that get released in the atmosphere. Here is just a small picture showing some of those sources, a little bit easier to, to show in your head. Fossil fuel use, so cars, factories, uh, coal plants, all that kind of stuff, all that produces these greenhouse gases. Landfills with the methane. We've got cows, digestive process, and agriculture, and then deforestation. So those are the main sources that we think of for human-caused sources of greenhouse gases. Breaking those down by category, I find this pretty fascinating. So just if we just look at methane, by far, well not by far, but the majority of methane production in the United States is from livestock digestion. So just from the fact that we grow a lot, a lot of cows and sheep, cows and pigs and all those things that we use for our meat production. The second largest is landfills. A lot of methane produced in our landfills. And then just the combustion of natural gas and petroleum. We're producing a lot of methane in those processes. Coal mining also, um, manure management, that's interesting. Just uh, the manure can break down, the, how we use that manure. A little bit from combustion, and then there's a big chunk, rice cultivation, that's interesting. A little, or quite a big chunk for other. So just another bit, a big category. N2O, nitrous oxide, by far it's agricultural. All agricultural. A little bit from combustion and other things. And finally, carbon dioxide. This is interesting because look at the scale. This ends at 2.5%. So the next category down from fossil fuel use for energy is fossil fuels not used for energy. And then finally, some of these other things, cement manufacture, accidental leaks, and then a tiny bit from municipal, municipal solid waste combustion, but 94% of our CO2 production. So that would go way off the chart to the right is used from burning fossil fuels for energy. And I was curious, um, especially methane, because this seemed just so large compared to the other categories. I went on the internet and did a little bit of research and there's a project called the Global Carbon Project where they're really trying to dig in and map out these kind of things. And I liked this depiction of our emissions for methane. So it shows these numbers here. And these are in million tons of CH4 per year, the averages between 2003, 2012. So they took these averages, which is the number here. So 105, so relatively speaking, you know, the larger the number, the larger total emissions. 105 from fossil fuels, agriculture and waste, 188. So there's the big, biggest category. Um, biomass burning, a little bit there. And then these are the natural sources. So wetlands and other natural emissions. Again, so this is stuff from, like I mentioned, termites, um, deep sources in water, low, Wetlands where there's low oxygen, all this stuff. This is natural sorts of the denitrification process. All of that totals 558. Then we have these things called sinks. Where can it go back into naturally? Well, they can go into the atmosphere and do chemical reactions, or they can go back into soils. But we see this 10. So this is the positive growth rate average per year. So we have this 10, which means we don't have enough sinks to really put our emissions to zero or below. So they're, when they're trying to talk about a net zero emission process, they have to look at all the sources of how we can put this back into somewhere, get rid of it versus how much we produce. So this is our global methane budget. This was data from 2016, I believe. 
this is 2012, but the report was in 2016. So I went on that website and I also looked for a similar graph for CO2. And then similarly, this shows the units here. Uh, what are the units? I don't actually know the units, but relatively speaking, we can look at the numbers. This 0.5, see there's our little volcano source. We've got 35 from our fossil fuel energy reserves. Deforestation, we get plus six. Um, then we have this kind of back and forth between vegetation and, so remember plants will take that and take in that, that CO2. They use that as an energy source. So that goes back into the biosphere, that's a sink. Then we have a whole bunch of atmospheric carbon up here that's going into the atmosphere, it's about plus 18. Notice the other sink, a lot of it goes back into the oceans as well. But we still have this big positive 18 here. So we're trying to track that each year to figure out where our sources are. If you're curious, just Google Global Carbon Project and you can find more of this information and graphs. It's really interesting to read about. So that's the last slide here we have for our, uh, this section. I'll go back to the beginning here. Again, our key idea is we just kind of define what, what we mean by global warming, what we mean by global climate change, and really dug into the sources or how solar radiation greenhouse gases warm. And then really, what are the sources of those? Where do they come from? So next time we'll dig into how CO2 concentrations have changed over time, and then talk about the feedback loop. How is increasing CO2 actually causing a feedback to increase it even more? So I'll see you guys then for the next lecture.